the military heart of the Nazi war machine. This bunker was Hitler's nerve center. A city of concrete and steel designed to command millions of soldiers. To control a vast empire. And direct a world war. Germany as a military machine is now completely and utterly unstoppable. A base engineered to hide the leaders of the Third Reich. Within this massive megastructure, is just one big nest of Nazis. And built on a scale to match Hitler's lust for power. Staggered, absolutely staggered. This is the story of the Third Reich's center of power and Hitler's most secret headquarters, the Wolf's Lair. The biggest construction projects of World War II ordered by Hitler to secure world domination. Now they survive as dark reminders of the Fuhrer's fanatical military ambition. These are the secrets of the Nazi megastructures. The 20th of July, 1944. Hitler isolates himself in his two and a half square mile bunker complex while his German armies are in retreat. As his grip on Europe weakens, he withdraws further into his concrete base. His paranoia grows. And a group of German rebels plot to turn the bunkers of the wolf's lair against him. Battlefield archaeologist Dr. Tony Pollard is exploring the incredible ruins of Hitler's top secret headquarters. This is a massive bunker. It's looming out of the forest like some sort of Mayan temple. The complex grew continuously between 1940 and 1944. This place is expanded, it's modified, it's further fortified. And Hitler was absolutely paranoid about being attacked here, especially from the air. And we get several phases of extension where more concrete is poured, the walls are made thicker, the roofs are made thicker, and we're seeing evidence for that here. This maze of concrete was the Fuhrer's home. It's weird to think that Hitler slept here. And engineered to an astonishing scale. It has to be totally self-sufficient they're essentially building a city in a swamp. The roots of these headquarters lie in the very first days of the war. On the 1st of September, 1939, Hitler's armies race across the Polish border. World War II has begun. The Germans are coming up against a, a nation which is not militarily strong. What is projected out are images of Stukas diving on Warsaw, of columns of half-tracks and armoured cars and tanks. This early success convinces Hitler of his own military genius. He begins to ignore the advice of his army generals. Professor Stephen Remy is an expert on Nazi Germany. Hitler doesn't trust his military generals. He's afraid that their loyalty lies with the old German state that he and the Nazis have overthrown. Senior German soldiers are traditionally upper-class aristocrats, and many despise the Fuhrer. One of the reasons why a lot of the senior officers don't like Hitler is because they know that in the First World War, he never rose beyond corporal, that he's essentially working class, and it's nothing short of pure snobbery. Hitler is becoming paranoid. He believes the only way to keep control of his generals is to lead from the front. He leaves the safety of Berlin for the war zone in Poland on his specially designed train. His train is, to a certain extent, the nerve center of the war effort because he's the Fuhrer, he's the commander, and everyone has to come to him. Two streamlined locomotives pull a convoy of 15 carriages. 
anti-aircraft flak wagons top and tail the train. At its heart is Hitler's private carriage, followed by the command unit for war conferences. Hitler is determined to direct the war personally. Hitler doesn't care how inconvenient it is for everybody else that he wants to be on this train. People have to leave the battlefront, traipse across country, either by plane or by car, just so that they can be harangued by him. Poland is conquered by the 6th of October, 1939. It's a stunning victory. Hitler's next target is France and then Britain. The Allies' sophisticated planes and bombs make his train vulnerable. Hitler still wants to be close to the front lines, so he demands a new kind of HQ. He orders a base near the Belgian border codenamed Rocky Nest, or Felsenest in German. All that remains today are photographs and rubble. Patrick Berry, a former British Army officer and expert on fortifications, uncovers the hidden ruins of Hitler's first bunkers. This is the Felsenest. It is completely overgrown, unmarked, and been ignored for the last 70 years. Yet beneath the trees are the ruins of Hitler's very first fixed wartime headquarters. The Führer is protected by two rings of high security, swarming with checkpoints and soldiers. The inner ring is the heart of the site. Two bunkers with adjacent wooden huts are built for Hitler and his entourage. Hitler arrives at Felsenest on the 10th of May, 1940. He orders the attack on Western Europe during the journey. Early in the morning, the German invasion begins. This bunker was Hitler's nerve center. It was from here that he commanded the invasion of Western Europe. The bunker was known as Building K, and it consisted of five small rooms named A to E. Room A is Hitler's office. His bedroom is just eight feet square. Hitler's staff occupy the remaining rooms. At one and a half meters thick of reinforced concrete and sunk into the ground to give it added protection. This is the rooftop of Hitler's bunker. Hitler is fearful of attack. He demands the bunkers be engineered to seal him against the outside world. You've got three pipes which would have provided the ventilation for the bunker. And obviously below ground you're going to need fresh air, but crucially you also need in these bunkers they have protection from gas, sealed doors and special filters to clear the air in the event of a gas attack. Um, this relates directly to Hitler's own experiences in the First World War, when gas was a major killer and then the concrete to protect you was probably the best thing you could have if you were fighting from the trenches. So all in all Hitler's stamp is all over this bunker. We have forced to the enemy. To withdraw from our borders. The bunker protects the Führer from the war, but at the same time isolates him from his generals. His total belief in his own genius grows. Hitler's command style means that he's reluctant to delegate authority to any of his generals by entombing himself in this concrete bunker. Hitler is basically saying other opinions are not welcome. Hitler delivers many of his orders from a briefing hut nearby. This doesn't look like much, but in 1940, I would have just walked through the door into the bustling epicenter of the Third Reich's war machine. These old foundations are very historically significant because inside these walls, Hitler briefed his generals about what was going on in the invasion of France. Success follows success as Hitler's military sweeps past his headquarters and across Western Europe. 
By the 6th of June, 1940, the advance has been so rapid that Felsenest is now far behind the front lines. Less than three weeks later, France surrenders. Hitler is triumphant. The French campaign is another astonishing military victory. In Hitler's opinion, his command style of leading from the front from concrete headquarters has been completely vindicated. The Felsen nest has proved its worth. Hitler always sees himself as something of a military leader, but, but if he did in 1939, he doubly does so by June 1940 when France surrenders. It's hard to overemphasize the enormity of this success. Hitler has now doubled the size of his Nazi empire. His frontline officers are impressed by his military ability. One such officer is 32-year-old Catholic aristocrat and father of five, Klaus von Stauffenberg. Stauffenberg's background is decidedly aristocratic, and on one level, you would have thought he would be suspicious of Hitler, but actually, he buys into it. But, and really, the reason why so many of the aristocratic military elite do kowtow to Hitler is because he's brought back pride in being German. Like many Germans, von Stauffenberg fully supports the war, and he is impressed by Hitler's apparent military skill. Soldiers like to win. The bombers will smoke them out of the forest. If we strike fast, we can cut this rebel off. It seems to be quite incredible, and everyone thinks that uh, um, Germany as a military machine is now completely and utterly unstoppable. What they also think is that Hitler is clearly a great war leader, and no one thinks that more than Hitler himself. July 1940. Hitler has conquered Western Europe from specialized command centers. His next headquarters will expand the concept on a huge scale. Hitler is convinced massive frontline command centers are vital to his success. Now he looks east to Russia. In 1940, Germany has a peace treaty with Russia, but Hitler has been targeting it from the start. He believes that the conquest of Russia will bring Germany vast new territories. Hitler plans for an epic invasion, using four million soldiers along an 1,800-mile front. The attack will be codenamed Barbarossa. Operation Barbarossa is a military operation unlike any that's been seen before. The scale of it is absolutely enormous. That requires one heck of a lot of coordination. So he wants a command headquarters as close as possible to the front, whilst at the same time still being safe. For the impending attack, Hitler needs a base as far east as possible. He chooses a site near the city of Rustenburg, then in eastern Germany. Felsenest is the template. The concept is to bring all the branches of the armed forces around Hitler's headquarters. This will emphasize Hitler's preeminence as the center of power, planning, and control. The terrain around the base makes it difficult to attack. This site close to the Russian border was the location chosen for Hitler's eastern headquarters. It's a land dominated by forest and lakes, but it's also peppered with swamps. It would have been a nightmare for any army to attack. The swamps make building underground bunkers extremely difficult. In the autumn of 1940, Fritz Tott, the head of Nazi engineering group organization Tott, personally takes charge of the project. He decides that heavily reinforced structures above ground are the solution. The budget is 36 million Reichsmarks an incredible $250 million today. But it's vital that this work is carried out in secret, because if the Russians spot what's going on, it would be a disaster. Amazingly, the chosen site sits directly beneath the daily route of Russia's Moscow to Berlin airliner. The forest means it's never discovered. Work on the wolf's lair began in the winter of 1940, 
The project would require upwards of 50,000 laborers working in incredibly difficult conditions. Local people were told it was going to be a new chemical plant. What they didn't know was that the end result would be one of the Nazis' most audacious megastructures. Soldiers protect German laborers to maintain security for the top secret project. While construction is underway, Hitler continues to use his train, but he's paranoid about being attacked from the air. At the same time that this new Führer HQ bunker complex is being built, he also insists on building a, a series of tunnels in which his train can hide uh, and where he can be safe so that he can be even closer to the front. One shelter in the occupied Polish town of Stelpina still remains. It's capable of withstanding any assault, as tunnel expert Maciej Pienkosz explains. The train here in Stelpina could hide from any danger, from air raid, shelling or a chemical attack, as the interior of this shelter is closed off. In the summer of 1940, Nearly 6,000 Polish slave laborers begin construction on the 1,300-foot-long tunnel. Above us, we have three-meter thick walls made up of reinforced concrete. The inside of this wall is filled with tons of armored steel, which makes them able to withstand strikes and explosions of even a half-ton bomb. Despite taking a year to complete, the massive tunnel is only used by Hitler once during the entire war, for a meeting with Italian dictator Benito Mussolini. By summer 1941, preparations are complete for Hitler's masterstroke, the invasion of Russia. And the ultimate Führer HQ is ready for occupation. On the 22nd of June, 1941, Germany invades Russia. Two days later, Hitler arrives at his newest headquarters. His military codename is Wolf, so he names it the Wolf's Lair. The wolf's lair represents a massive upscale from the felsen nest, probably eight times the size. You can see natural defenses, trees, swamps, marshes, lakes, and the man-made structures. What you have are three layers of defense. An airstrip and rail lines are built for the Fuhrer's personal plane and train and the entire two-and-a-half-square-mile site is surrounded by 54,000 mines. Expanding on the Felsenest prototype, the base has three concentric rings of security surrounding Hitler's command center. Hundreds of troops from Hitler's personal bodyguard patrol the forest, day and night. Look at this! just a scoop in the ground today, but this is a foxhole, dug by soldiers probably to accommodate a two-man machine gun unit. And I can see stretching out in front of me, here's another one, about three meters away, exactly the same thing. And again, over here, these would obviously have been deeper during the war, but you can still see them. Russia collapses in the first weeks of the invasion. The front line moves far away from the wolf's lair. Hitler feels secure in his new base, and so confident of victory that he chooses not to advance with the troops. It's a critical error. His distance from the front and his generals leaves him disconnected and begins to affect his decisions. In September 1941, he orders his generals to stop their advance on Moscow and attack other Russian cities. The invasion grinds to a halt with massive casualties. Hitler is becoming more and more mistrustful, and he increasingly dominates decision-making personally. Determined to wipe out the Russians, Hitler orders the killing of millions of civilians. 
Many German soldiers see the order as immoral and dishonorable. 34-year-old Klaus von Stauffenberg, a devout Catholic, is one of them. In May 1942, torn between his loyalty to Germany and his sense of honor, he decides that Hitler's megalomania is the greater evil. Resignation would mean death, so he chooses to plot in secret against the Führer. By the summer, Hitler's armies begin to retreat, chased by huge numbers of Russian forces. The truth is, Hitler has just bitten off more than he can chew in the Soviet Union. Hitler's paranoia increases, and he isolates himself further by fortifying the wolf's lair. 1,500 troops now patrol the area, and dozens of additional buildings are added across the site. Hitler is the head of the Nazi Empire. None of his generals dare to question him. All operations revolve around him, but his behavior is increasingly eccentric. Hitler wakes late at 10 a.m. Conferences take place when he chooses, regardless of the military situation. He'd have a session just after lunch, maybe for a couple of hours, where he'd meet with his senior commanders and discuss the situation, and then perhaps an hour and a half or another two hours in the evening. But the rest of the time, he seemed to spend his time relaxing or, shall we say, entertaining his company with these long oratories. In Stalingrad, German forces fight bloody battles in the city. At the Wolf's Lair, Hitler demands staff attend daily afternoon parties at a specially built tea room. Oh, look. There doesn't appear to be much left of this, but that's the first time on this site that I've seen ceramic tiles. And this is the known location of one of these tea rooms, and that would certainly be indicative of either a washroom or a kitchen area, the sort of thing you would associate with a tea room. 300,000 troops are going hungry in Stalingrad. But Hitler dismisses reports that interrupt his schedule, no matter the consequences. And it's really quite a thought to imagine you just sat around shooting the breeze when outside of this bubble, all mayhem is breaking out. Desperate to stay close to the center of power, the Nazi leadership rushed to build their own bunkers around Hitler. Hitler's chiefs of staff were very keen to remain close to him, so Yodel, Keitel, Göring and Co. all had their own bunkers here at the Wolf's Lair. And I like to imagine them having some kind of bunker envy. My bunker's bigger than your bunker. But what you have at the end of the day within this massive megastructure is just one big nest of Nazis. Luftwaffe Commander-in-Chief Hermann Göring constructs a 177 thousand cubic foot bunker inside a 36 foot high concrete shell is insulated by a layer of sand designed to absorb an explosive blast it has survived in remarkable condition this is interesting see there's a, a double skinned wall here on the side of the bunker and that's to provide added protection for a a bomb blast outside, so this gap will kind of dissipate the pressure wave. Almost 95% of this enormous structure is solid concrete, leaving a tiny living space inside. Wow. I'm on the roof of uh, Goering's personal bunker, and it's it's cracked. It looks like a crashed spaceship or something. On top of the bunker are two anti-aircraft gun emplacements. Wow. 
there's a circular concrete platform on which the gun would have sat. You can see the holes for the bolts, the mounting bolts. And it's in a very heavy concrete turret with little cubby holes in the side, which would have stored ready-to-use ammunition. A defensive position to protect against ground assault faces the forest. What we have here is a very simple form of fortification, very typically German. This is a Tobruk turret. And I'm very pleased to see it's still got its mount, because this would have had a machine gun mounted on this rail. And there would have been two men in here, one operating the gun, one feeding the belt of ammunition. And the gun would have turned 360 degrees on this iron ring. The giant bunkers are obvious even within the forest. So ingenious camouflage is used. What they would have done is take camouflage nets with artificial leaves on them, strung them out from these hoops, both across the roof and into the trees, making this structure blend into the natural vegetation. February 1943. Germany is defeated at Stalingrad. In July, Hitler hastily orders a counterattack from his bunker in the Wolf's Lair. It's crushed, and Germany is under threat like never before. Hitler is entirely responsible for the failure of Barbarossa. They weren't ready for it, they didn't have enough manpower, it was a step too far, it was entirely his idea, um, and it was a failure. For the first time, the wolf is vulnerable in his lair. Hitler's isolation in his bunker complex has led to a series of terrible military decisions. Germany is under assault. The Führer's paranoia is stoked by fear of air attacks. He orders a new mammoth bunker built for himself. By late 1943, Hitler's spending more and more time at the Wolf's Lair, to the point where it's the only part of Germany he's still familiar with. And it's at this time that he introduces a new phase of modifications to the site. And they include his own designs for his own personal shelter. Construction begins on a massive structure. 200 feet long and 120 feet wide. 23 feet of concrete divided by a layer of sand will surround the Führer on all sides. Inside, Hitler's living space will be a tiny 9 by 11 feet. His staff are astonished by the scale of the building work. It's incredible what they achieved in such a short time. Hitler's personal bunker is the biggest building on the site. And looking at it, you can understand why contemporaries compared it to an Egyptian tomb. And especially if you take a peek inside, you can see how thick the walls are here. And I think it's probably a reflection of his state of mind. The war's starting to go badly for Germany, and he's becoming more and more isolated. And I think this is a kind of manifestation of that decline. Although its exact layout has never been fully verified, the bunker contains a warren of corridors and small rooms. This is absolutely staggering. I found a way into the back of Hitler's air raid bunker. And look at it, it's just concrete, but it looks almost geological. But the amazing thing is that that level down there is the accommodation level. You can see the 
fragments of a room there, but all of this above me, and it must go up eight meters or so. It's difficult, difficult to tell, but incredibly high above me is the top of the structure, and all of that is roof, with this tiny living space beneath it. And I think what we might be looking at here, see, you've got these girders dropping down from the roof. I think we might have a two-level roof with an open space, a gap between the two, supported by these girders. And that would provide some extra protection if a bomb comes through the top. It would dissipate the shock wave. This gives a very good idea of the way this thing was meant to operate but staggered, absolutely staggered. This final stage of the wolf's lair uses material desperately needed elsewhere for the war effort, including enough concrete to build the Empire State Building three and a half times over. The massive fortifications only help Hitler's complete withdrawal from reality. I'm still picking my way through the remains of Hitler's bunker complex and the scale of the thing is phenomenal. And he distrusts people so much that he draws up a list of those people who were permitted to come and have lunch with him. And the picture is one of increasing paranoia and isolation. That isolation from the war has led Hitler to make appalling military decisions. Von Stauffenberg has experienced the results personally losing a hand and an eye in battle. He and a network of sympathizers are plotting Hitler's downfall. It's a choice between two evils, action or inaction. He's a soldier first and foremost, and you know, he has a sense of honor, and what he sees in the Eastern Front, the atrocities really, really shock him. You know, you don't go around mass murdering people. That's not part of the deal at all. And so he's even more determined than ever that Hitler has to be brought down. The war is being lost, and von Stauffenberg is convinced that Germany can only be saved if Hitler is killed. I sincerely believe God has assigned me this mission. I will devote myself to it entirely. We must gather information about military forces in the Berlin area. He wants a peace treaty with the Allies that leaves Germans in control of Germany, the country unoccupied, and the Nazi party eradicated. Stauffenberg needs a plan to overthrow the Fuhrer, but access to him is virtually impossible. Hitler is massively protected, and it's extremely difficult to get a means of killing him anywhere close to him. As the wolf's lair grows, Germany shrinks in the face of the Russian advance. The 6th of June, 1944, D-Day. The Americans and British land in France. It's a decisive blow to Germany. Defeat is imminent. Von Stauffenberg must find a way to kill Hitler before Germany is crushed. Stauffenberg's problem is that Hitler keeps changing his travel plans at the last minute and has avoided numerous assassination attempts by doing so. So Stauffenberg needs to target him in a fixed location. Despite its immense security, von Stauffenberg decides that the Wolf's Lair is the only viable target. He plans to turn the isolated headquarters against the Fuhrer. But there's another problem. Stauffenberg is excluded from Hitler's inner circle until the middle of July, when he gets an extraordinary break. Von Stauffenberg is promoted to a post that gives him permission to attend Hitler's conferences at the Wolf's Lair. Stauffenberg now has the access he needs. He decides to personally carry out the attack and detonate explosives at a meeting with Hitler. 
the plan hinges on using the Wolf's Lair's massive engineering against the Fuhrer. If von Stauffenberg can detonate the bomb inside a concrete bunker, the explosion will kill everyone inside. On the 20th of July, 1944, von Stauffenberg is ordered to a briefing at the Wolf's Lair. This is his chance. The bomb's 30-minute fuse has been armed. It's too hot. Please. He's told that the meeting has been moved from a concrete bunker to a lightweight brick hut. The well-ventilated and thin-walled building could limit the bomb's destructive power, but it's too late to turn back now. He must improvise and find a way to get the bomb as close to Hitler as possible. Would you please place me close to the Führer? I have trouble hearing due to my injuries. Yes, come in. Another officer unknowingly carries the bomb inside. The second army, it's no use. The objective now is to keep the Soviet troops occupied so long. The bomb is placed just six feet from Hitler. I have told General Mannerheim that the interests of the German people and the Finnish people are identical. Here is Colonel von Stauffenberg, mein Führer. Mein Führer? So, the so, Russian the positions here are here and here. here. We need to prevent the Romanian oil fields from falling into Russian hands. Von Stauffenberg claims he has to make a telephone call and leaves the room. It has been almost 30 minutes since he armed the bomb. That's the truth now. As it currently stands. We cannot prevent it. That's a planned attack from Feind. Where is Stauffenberg? It's his turn. Von Stauffenberg has brought the war to the wolf's lair and to the wolf himself. Aftermath of the explosion, panicked Nazis race to locate Hitler. Von Stauffenberg bluffs his way past security. He's convinced he has succeeded in killing Hitler and heads to Berlin to seize control. Four officers are dead, but Hitler is alive. The briefing room is a pretty lightweight structure. It's got brick walls, windows, it's well ventilated, very much in contrast with the heavy concrete bunkers elsewhere on the site. And it's that architectural difference which foils the assassination attempt. Footage filmed just after the explosion reveals the damage. When the bomb goes off, there's somewhere for the explosion to go. 
It blows out the windows, it knocks down walls. It dissipates the blast. If this meeting had happened in the heart of one of those solid bunkers, as had been the original intention, there would have been nowhere for the blast to go. It would have been amplified as it bounced off the walls and back in again. If that had happened, there can be no doubt that Hitler would have been killed. It's one of the great ironies that the wolf's lair saved his life, but not in the way he intended. By the time that Soren Stauffenberg arrives in Berlin, he knows that the, that the bomb has gone off, but, but it becomes increasingly apparent that Hitler hasn't actually died. Hitler's injuries are minor, but his narrow escape has left him enraged. For all its concrete and layers of security, the wolf's lair proved to be defenseless against one man with a bomb in a briefcase. Nazi investigators quickly realized that von Stauffenberg left the meeting early. Those who are loyal to Hitler uh, start to, to realize what is going on. Uh, the coup is undone very quickly. Hitler's troops tracked the ringleaders to Berlin's army headquarters. Von Stauffenberg and his fellow plotters are dragged out into the courtyard from where they are operating the plot uh, and summarily executed on the spot. In the following weeks, 600 suspected conspirators are arrested and publicly tried by Nazi judges. Around 200 are eventually executed. At the wolf's lair, Hitler watches the films of their deaths for his own pleasure, but he ignores the catastrophic situation in the war. By the end of August, the Russians are less than 60 miles from the base. It's all very well having an impregnable, bomb-proof forward headquarters, but if the area in which it sits is overrun, then it's no good to anybody. The greatest flaw of the wolf's lair is that it's only safe if Germany's armies are victorious. Ultimately, no fortress, however strong, could protect Germany from the catastrophe that Hitler had led it to. It's the Luftwaffe manages to even find This is a damn disgrace! On the 8th of November, construction finishes on Hitler's enormous personal bunker. But he spends only 12 days inside it. With the Russians entering Germany, the war is closing in around him. In November 1944, Hitler left the wolf's lair for the last time along this railway. In total, he'd spent over 800 days in residence, longer than at any other place during the war. The Russians were hot on his heels, but they simply circumvented the place on their way to Berlin. And it wasn't until January of 1945 that the Germans got round to trying to demolish it. Local people describe huge chunks of concrete flying through the air as the charges were blown. The wolf's lair was history. Wolf's lair was meant to be Hitler's impregnable fortress and the command center from which he'd conquer the world. But ultimately, no base, however big, could protect Hitler from his own flaws, paranoia, and military incompetence.